I, I'm looking to spoil spoil that debut, you know. So, um, but I know he's going to be tough. He he's he seems to be uh, seems to like um, stand up a lot, but he's also a pretty good grappler too. Um, I don't think he's that good off his back, which is going to be, you know, kind of which kind of plays in my favor. I, I like being on top, so. You return at USD 270 against Salman Oliveira, another contender series winner like yourself. Take us into the first weeks of uh, training camp after you get that opponent signed. Um, actually, you know, as soon as my fight was over, I, t- I took a week off and, um, you know, I was back to working out again. So, so I, I've said this before, my life is almost like a training camp, you know, like I, whether I'm fight or not, I'm fighting or not. Um, there's always people that I'm, I'm close with my friends and my teammates that have fights as well. So, um, it's almost my job to make sure that I'm in shape to help those guys as well. So, um, you know, everything's kind of been the same, but once you get an opponent, obviously it, it feels a lot better because now you, you can kind of focus on, um, almost like just more of the visualization of, of how the fight's going to go. You picture their face on like your own, on imaginary body while you're shadow boxing and stuff too. So, um, just once you get an opponent, you know, then you can actually lock in on what exactly it is you should be doing in order to, to, uh, be successful in the fight. How, much of an impact does that have on a fighter like yourself shadow boxing because you know from a, a fan's perspective shadow boxing is like what are they doing you know but for a fighter it's it's a huge part of you know your development i think it's it's really good because it's it's you know you can you can shadow box and go through the motions and move really slow when i shadow box i like to go with the same you know speed and and almost as much power as I would in a fight because that's, you know, and my coach, uh, C. Bruno, talks about a lot. Um, you have to miss correctly as well. You know, you have to know how to have your feet under you. And if you're throwing big punches and you're used to hitting a bag that is always there and is always going to keep your weight under you, um, that bag work is good. But um, shadow boxing is important as well because when you miss a punch, which happens, and nobody uh, aims to miss punches, but when you miss a punch, you have to be able to have your feet under you. And uh, that on top of just visualizing the person's face, you know, when I shadow box, I try to I incorporate takedowns, clinch in my head, you know, even me, um, you know, even me on my back, I work to get up. So it looks funny when you when you see someone doing all those different things by themselves, um, like being against the cage and, you know, on your butt and then working back up. But all of it, all of it's important. It, it's good to visualize. And um, even when you're not shadow boxing, you're constantly visualizing, you almost become obsessed with um almost not specifically the person but their face and when you visualize the fight so um it's it's important that the visualization visualization is very important when leading up to a fight the faces Oliver's face you know you look him up what are your thoughts on him and and his style of fighting he's a a, a tough guy you know that's that's but you know, I, I get to this point, and that's why I'm here to fight the best. You know, he's another tough, tough opponent. Uh, he's coming off the contender series, so we kind of have the same route. Um, he's had a lot of fights. I think he's 18 and three, so he's kind of like me on the contender series. I had a lot of fights already, and um, you know, he, he's an experienced fighter. He's, I think he's maybe on like a seven fight win streak, similar to how I was coming off the contender series. You know, so um, you know, I, I know he's excited, and I know what those emotions are like getting into the into the UFC and I still have those emotions you know um but but you know I'm looking to spoil spoil that debut you know so um but I know he's gonna be tough he he's he seems to be uh seems to like um stand up a lot but he's also a pretty good grappler too um I don't think he's that good off his back which is gonna be you know kind of which kind of plays in my favor I, I like being on top so um but it should be a good fight. I expect him to be tough. I expect him to fight from beginning to end. He's a, he's a scrapper, and he doesn't quit. So fights like that really really make me excited because I picture myself being the same way. So I don't think we're going to have any trouble finding each other in the middle. And being only 30 years old and, and, and a few fights into your UFC career is, is a good spot to be in, right, for your development. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I, you know, I'm, it, it's, it's so crazy to think that I'm 30 years old now. You know, I'm used to, <laughs> yeah, I can say now I can say, oh, yeah, my 20s, such and such. But um, but yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 30 years old and I have a lot of fights. And but, you know, I'm still new. It's still not new, but somewhat new. I'm still I'm still new into the UFC and I'm still learning a lot. And, you know, with the move down to American Top Team, I, you know, every day I learned that. I still have a lot of learning to do and uh you know I'm just trying to continue to to soak up as much as I can and to keep advancing you know so and and I feel like I can I can still see improvements every day it's it's an improvement every fight I feel like I improve um you know I lost my last fight but I can see a lot of improvements in that fight as well Yeah let's talk about the last fight you know what I mean it didn't go your way what improvements did you see in that one I think the biggest thing for me would be um, you know, you, you get so close to finishing a fight and then the next round, I think I kind of lost focus of the way I got to that moment. You know, I took my time. I didn't load up on punches. I, you know, I, I attacked his legs, I attacked his body and I, I kept working up and, and I just kind of threw that out, threw it out the window in the second round. You know, I, the whole time I just wanted to hit him with a big shot, you know, which realistically I should have continued to do what got me to that point in the first place. So, um, I think that's a learning experience and that's that's just another you know that that takes some time and some maturity in that level to to understand that um, you know a fight isn't over until it's over. you know you can be as confident as you want with the way you approach it, but until it's over, anything can happen. yeah, building that fight IQ and and mental maturity in the fight game. Absolutely. That's so. That, that's the biggest, my biggest takeaway. You know that I can take from that. Um, just to continue to, to um, to do what's making, what's giving me success, and um, you know, just continue to mix up. You know, the grappling. I wish I'd uh, um, probably grappled a little more j- just to, uh, you know, just to add more elements into the fighting. But um, you know, like I said, now I know the next fight will be different. You know, training camp at the end of the year. You know, some places it kind of thins out, right? People are going home or they just take some time off because it's the holidays. Were your preparations any different? You know, did you have any additions or subtractions to your surroundings? No, every everything's pretty much been the same. You know, at American Top Team, there are some people that did some traveling, but we have so many people that even when um, – there's so many people that live here and from all over the place. But some people travel, but also there's still a lot of people that stuck around and uh, also have fights because – people are fighting all the time. So, um, you know, some people left, but they're probably a good amount of people as well that still also have fights at the beginning of the year. So, um, and they will have a lot of, a, a good group of training partners who are consistent as well. So, um, you know, it's thinned out a little, but you know, we have so many little guys as well that, that there's never any, you know, any like, um, lack of, lack of, uh, partners in, in the gym. Who have been your partners for this camp? Um, so far, um, we have a group of guys that we usually work with. Um, his name's well. These are a lot of guys that people don't know yet, you know. So, they, but they're they're gonna be up there. Um, Sal Guerrero, uh, Jason Eason, Mauricio Gomez. Um, th- those those guys help me a lot. Those are kind of like my my core group. But I also work with. Um, I work with I work with almost everybody. I uh, just had a couple of spar rounds with Adriano Morais. Um Kyoji's taking some time off right now, but usually Kyoji's in there. Um Pedro's about to come back. Um so Pedro's gonna start working a little bit. Uh, Ricky Mendejas, uh Andre Sukumta, and um uh, Marlon Morais. Marlon. Um, there's a lot of people, a, a whole lot of people that uh, you know, I hate I hate missing people. But uh, those are those are probably the core group of people that I've been working with the most lately, um, which are a lot of really tough guys. So um, those are those are the main people that I usually end up um, working with the most. What are the benefits for you to be training with guys that you have fought already? Because there's a few at American Top Team. Uh huh. Yeah. So <clears throat> for one one that um, I fought is Ricky Bandejas, and Ricky's Ricky's good. Ricky's really good, and. Uh, it's actually, you know, it's not as awkward as you would think because um, Ricky's a really laid back guy. I'm a pretty laid back guy, and um, 
it's almost one of those things we never talked about unless like I crack a joke and you know, he, he, he beat me by submission and we'll be doing something like, Oh, you're going to choke me again. Like you did a couple of years ago, you know, but, but no, it, it's, it's really cool because Ricky, Ricky is a, he's a very special athlete. Um, he's a longer guy. He's, he's a lot stronger than he looks. He looks skinny, but he's really strong. And, uh, he, he's a good, a good, uh, partner to have. And Andre Supermtal, we, we never fought, but we were supposed to fight a couple of times. And he also is another, another really good partner. He's, and also a really great guy too. Um, but he, you know, he, he's another tough person and he's a good partner to have too. So it's, it's really cool to, to, um, you know, get to have those, get to be around those guys and actually, um, you know, meet those guys and understand that those are, those are great individuals as well as great fighters. Do you guys critique each other? You know what I mean? Cause you've prepared for each other. And even though you didn't fight Andre, he's probably seen you from a different perspective and probably told you like, Hey, I see this, maybe this opening, maybe you should look into that. Has, has those conversations happened? Yeah, we, we do things like that all the time. You know, when it comes to, um, you know, grappling, sometimes I helps him, I help him with wrestling and he helps me with striking as well, you know? So, um, we're teammates. So when we, when we get in situations, whether, you know, once the goes happen, there's no animosity in, in any way. It's, if, if there's a situation where, you know, I feel like he could do something better. I'll tell him in the same way around on his side, if it's something that he thinks I can do better, he'll, he'll chime in and give me advice too. So, um, it's a very mutual, mutual training. It is a phenomenal dynamic of, of mixed martial arts, man. I love it. Um, the holidays during the end of the year can be very hectic. How do you handle any of the family or friends' obligations during like Thanksgiving and Christmas while you're in camp? It's it's a little different. This this year has been a, little, a, a lot different, kind of. This is the first time we've actually spent a Christmas um, j- here, just the two, my wife and I, without, you know, us being with her parents or my parents. And, um, so think, let's see, Thanksgiving, I think we, we, we spent Thanksgiving here as well. I spent Thanksgiving with one of our friends, uh, that wrestled with in college, Carter. Um, but it's, it's been different. You know, we, we did a mini, uh, Thanksgiving Christmas type thing. Um, the, I think it was the first week of December. So it was kind of, a little bit like a weekend or so of a um, couple of, well maybe like four days of a little bit of both and it was a little different but you know once the fight's over um, we're planning on going to Universal Studios with family and uh you know kind of kind of make up for a little bit of that that's nice that's nice now you know you've always bounced back really strong after a loss what do you see in yourself or for yourself against Oliveira um j- just pace you know things that things things that I that I know that I'm good at, which is, um, my grappling, my pace. And, um, you know, I'm heavy handed, just making sure that, um, I'm moving my head, moving my feet, keeping a straight spine, good defense, basic things, you know, things that we all know. It's just making sure that you do it so much to where you don't have to think about it as much. And just making sure that no matter what I'm patient, I'm not loading up on any of my strikes and getting out of position and, um, just, just fighting just going out and and making it a high pace uh scrap all right a few more questions before i let you go what do you think mma fans obsess about too much that fighters really don't care about that's a good question um i don't know that that's a good question one thing that i i don't know if this really answers the question but one thing that i think like i think there's a lot of A lot of MMA fans are very, um, I guess the best word would be toxic. You know, they're so focused on like, you know, with other sports, it's you got people that are diehard fans for their team, you know. And I feel like a lot of MMA fans are kind of, uh, you know, if they're into a fighter, they lose and they're done with them, you know. But that's, that's just how the sport goes, you know. And I think a lot of fighter, a lot of fans can be very disrespectful when it comes to the approach of, um, you know, people losing fights, getting knocked out, et cetera, you know, I'm not really big on, um, memes of people getting knocked out and stuff like that. You know, whether I like the person or not, I, I'm not really big on, uh, you know, con- constantly putting someone down for getting knocked out in a sport where, I mean, anything can happen, you know? So, um, I don't know if that really answers your question, but, you know, I, I think that, 
I would say that's a that's a big thing. I don't know if, I'm not sure that like I said I'm not sure that answers your question. It does. It does, man. It does. You you take the question, you answer the question. It's all good. Um PTSD in combat sports, you know, there's injuries that happen, there's bad weight cuts, there's damage taken, there's losses. Have you experienced this or seen it in other fighters around you? I haven't personally experienced it other than the fact that, you know, if you lose or you're in a situation in the fight, well, I guess so. There's situations in the in a fight where, um, let's say, like, you lose because of a certain thing, you know, in your head. It's not so much PTSD for me, but, like, a quick reminder. And you get a, a quick flashback, and you're like, oh, no, got to fix this, you know. So it's – I wouldn't say PTSD in, like, a bad way, but it's a quick reminder that, that um, you know – like for example, my last fight, I know for sure now that I'm not gonna throw any big shots, get it, get wild, you know. I'm gonna stay focused, uh, regardless. Uh, make sure I'm not dropping my hands when I'm throwing punches. So that and um, you know, I could see, I could see where fighters are like that. I've, I've heard that a lot of times when people get, um, like if fighters get knocked out and they've been a lot of brawls, that um, obviously your your chin doesn't, your chin and your head doesn't really get any stronger. So um, I know there's some people that are like that, and I could see where somebody could, you know, be be worried that um, that could be the case again. You get knocked out once, and you think, oh man, like is it gonna be that easy? Is it gonna be easier the next time? So um, you know that that's something that I that I could see as well as an injury. You see people with um, people break their hands all the time. Maybe they throw punches differently, um, maybe more precise with their punches, and the same thing with kicks. And things like that as well. But personally, uh, I've been pretty fortunate to not have anything like traumatic happen to me other than losing, which which sucks. But um, you know, I just learned from those experiences and try to try to make sure that um, the next time around, I can I do my best to not let them happen again. Judging judging has become a major issue over the past couple of years, especially at the highest level. Open scoring. Is starting to be used more often now around the world. Would you like the major commissions to introduce it? I think open score. It's like bittersweet with open scoring because it's like as a fan, you know, you the 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 end is really dramatic when it's like you don't know who won the fight. You have in your head who you think won these rounds, and then when they, especially if it's a split decision, you know, it, it's it's more exciting to hear that at the end. But also from a fighter point of view. Um, Maybe fighters want to know, you know, if they're winning. Um, I like the old school way just because it's it does add more excitement to the fact, you know, and it probably feels much better when you don't know if you won and then, you know, the scoring comes in and then you win. But also it would be good to know, you know, whether you're winning or losing going into the third round. You know, you, there have been like, for example, uh, a couple fights ago, my, my fight that I had won my split decision, I could have sworn like it was pretty clear cut that I won um that I won the fight you know but it was a split decision and um you know that that for example if someone's that situation in the fight it would be good to know whether you're down going into the third but I guess the downfall would be um for for an entertainment um perspective could be like you know some guys could be up two rounds and could be really boring in the third but that happens anyway so you know it it, it I, i'm not sure i'm kind of on the fence about it i like the old school way but as far as like judging in general there could be better judges in general you know like there's some judges that have never fought or grappled a day in their lives and they're they're changing the whole trajectory of someone's career you know in finances you know they lose money because of because of it so i do think that I don't know what the criteria is to be a judge, but I do think that they should be required to at least have some martial arts experience, you know, some kickboxing, some boxing, wrestling, grappling, you know, just to understand um, what it's like. And it would be cool to have people that are former fighters be judges just to um, shed some more light on, on what it takes to win a fight and things like that. January 22nd, UFC 270, Anaheim, California. We will see you back in action, Tony. Thank you so much for the time, man. Good luck to you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 2022, it's, it's going to be a good year. I, I'm looking to you know, get the get it started with this win. Uh, hopefully, I can get at least three fights next year. That would be great in, in the year 3-0. and But, um, you know, start to January 22nd, 
uh, get the win and then we go from there.